Welcome to the Smart Connector, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs be the leader their ideal people love. Build your influence, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a Smart Connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. Welcome to the Smart Connect podcast dedicated to entrepreneurial relationship success. My name's Jane Baylor and I'm your host. Today, I'm so excited to be interviewing the fabulous Riaz Hanani. Riaz has a history of building and scaling successful businesses. He created one of the largest video advertising networks, building data-centric marketing campaigns before exiting to Silverpop, which he then scaled internationally. Silverpop helped to set out best practice for B2B marketing a decade ago and was a leader in B2B marketing automation and content marketing before exiting to IBM. Riaz has also sat on the DMA Email Marketing Council, helping to set best practice for the email marketing industry. He judges its awards and he's helped shape data privacy and the use of data in the UK. He also regularly speaks and writes on the intersection between marketing and technology, its best practice and future trends. So welcome, Riaz. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Jane. It's lovely to be here. Great. So just a little bit more about you before we carry on. So Riaz is known as a thought leader in account-based marketing and digital marketing. And for the past decade, he's built out successful data-led marketing teams for B2B SaaS platforms, implementing content marketing and marketing automation using an agile framework. So he specializes in marketing, product, operation, scaling, growth, account-based marketing product launches and field marketing, as well as a number of other strategies to do with tech and marketing. So Riaz launched and sold his marketing tech startup, Digital Oxygen, to Silverpop, which is now IBM, and he built the go-to market strategy of a data science consultancy. He also grew a global cloud video advertising platform, delivering multiple billions of video streams per month, and successfully built out the international marketing services and partner groups at Silverpop to create one of Europe's largest marketing automation platforms. So he's a real deep dive tech and marketing specialist. Is, is that right, Riaz? Is, is that the best way to describe you? It's been a, it's been a long 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So Riaz, tell, tell, tell us what your main focus is at the moment in Radio B3. I, I guess two or three years ago, I was talking to a large number of B2B marketing directors and, and really seeing the same problems occurring across the industry, really, which was everybody was creating large amounts of content. They were running events. They were tracking conversions on their website and, and generating marketing qualified leads for the pipeline. And yeah. everybody was doing the same thing. It became incredibly difficult to stand out. Yes. And, and worse, because there was so much content out there, the buying experience was becoming more and more difficult and, and certainly not very friendly. And so we sat down and we started to look at how could we solve those issues. And, and first and foremost, what we saw was account-based marketing is this idea that you develop a marketing plan for every single account, every single company that you wish to win. Now, of course, for most companies, especially in the UK, that's incredibly expensive not economical at all but with and, and this is where my tech marketing background starts to come in with the with the data that we have available today and the ability to make decisions as nowadays seems to be called ai for everything we can develop platforms that cut through the noise and in, you know in, in our case can deliver advertising direct to an individual company and is personalized to that company to to really cut through the noise. And then from there, basically rankings of companies that are in your target market yeah. that allow you to um, understand who you should talk to when. Okay. 
So, I mean, how does that manifest in terms of the customer experience? So, from the customer experience, uh, in, in some ways, I, I call what we do the antithesis to the ebook. Okay. Um, the ebook is this idea that will throw together every single problem that a company can solve and yeah. deliver it to the buyer in this vain hope, I think, that they're going to spend the hours it takes to trawl through an ebook to find the exact bits of it that are suitable to that person or that company. Um, yes. And what we're doing is saying, well, actually, if you spend a small amount of time understanding different segments or certainly key prospects within your market, you know, and certainly you can make good guesses as to what the specific problems are likely to be. And so rather than delivering um, a generic piece of content, you can del uh, deliver a personalized piece of content or personalized messaging that cuts straight through to the heart of the problem and shows the buyer that actually you understand them as a business. Okay, so I mean, how, how do you actually get to that place, Riaz? Because it sounds great. The process is obviously something that our listeners would be very interested in. So where does it start? Well, for us, uh, we, we start with the ability to identify whether they are present yeah. on a publisher's website. Using that technology, we can then present content to them um, on those publisher websites that, that obviously matches their needs. And, and so that's how we, that's how we go about doing it. That's, that's the sort of building block upon which we build. And then from there, we build custom experiences that, that makes that buying journey work more smoothly. Okay. How would you track and measure your success in that? There's several different ways and it, and it depends on really what our clients' requirements are. So for some of our clients, you know, what they're looking to try and do is to understand a level of intent, an idea of which whether the companies they're targeting are, they've got that problem at the moment and they're, they're doing research around it. And so obviously that falls down to in reality, a click and then understanding what the pages on the website that that company has browsed are. So that's one way um, we obviously track. And typically what we see is within three months, 20 to 30 percent of the companies that we've been targeting will appear on the website, either directly through a click or indirectly through, through a visit. Right, right. Can you give me an example of a, a client that you've done this for, Riaz, and a little bit of a case study? We typically work with technology and manufacturing companies. We, we have a few professional services customers as well. The example we always talk about um, is we had a company that was a SaaS business software as a service business, advertising for uh, about 12 months. And, and what we saw over those 12 months was actually really two big metrics that really changes for me the ball game from a, from a sales perspective. Because whilst this is, you know, it's called account-based marketing and it sits within marketing, it's very much a sales and marketing-led initiative. Yeah. And, and what we saw was the average deal size inside the pipeline for this particular company was six and a half times larger than non-targeted opportunities or deals in the pipeline. Okay. And then the other metric was that they were twice as likely to close. Yeah, that, that's 100% more, isn't it? Twice yeah. as likely. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So it really works. Yeah. It, and, and for me... You know, I think this is really just the start of a journey. I, I sort of equate it to um, where um, inbound marketing was at the very beginning of their journey. That, you know, we're, we're, for me, over time, I, you know, technology is really just starting to get, get crack this problem, if you like. And, and yeah. you know, today we talk about working with your best prospects, right? Your, your top 50, 100, 200, 500 yeah. companies. Um, obviously, companies have got tens of thousands of, of companies in their total addressable market, often, if not more. Yeah. And so over time, as the technology gets better and better, we, we expect it to, to actually be able to manage more and more of the, the companies in your addressable market. Right. So what we're moving towards is more targeted and sophisticated and clearer messages going out to the right companies and the right people over time 
Yeah, I think I think what's what we found really interesting is is that it changes the way marketers think about their market. Often marketers will think about their market in in broad terms of, of industries and and you know type, company types and yeah. the like. And and when they're doing their campaigns, that's how they're thinking. And, and account based marketing turns that on its head. Yeah. Suddenly, the it's the companies that are at the centre of your marketing program, and you start to think about actually what's my relationship with each of these companies, and 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 where do I need to move them to, in in a sort of relationship curve, I guess. Which is really interesting because that is about using technology to connect smartly with people. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's it's moving away from that blunt instrument model and. I think certainly for me, I, I very much feel on the end of that. I feel as though that there's just a bombardment of, of information and sales pitches that are just coming at, at you all the time via social media, that, that this is really a glimpse of the future where perhaps life is less complicated, but the things that do get through are the things that you really care about and want to know. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we, we've seen increasingly and rather unsurprisingly that people are much more averse to sharing contact details on websites they, they typically will visit a website two or three times before they'll actually com- you know convert in marketing speak and, and, and share their contact details and and so for us you know we, we, we in some ways bypass that by, by identifying those companies earlier but realistically even though we do that what we're doing is saying well actually which of these companies are worth you know a really good strategic fit yeah for our customers that they want to be picking up the phone and having a conversation earlier with them right right so what is the role of artificial intelligence in in all of this uh, yes there's large amounts of data and the ability to listen to all that data and analyze that data quickly, if not in real time, um, and then be able to make decisions, therefore, about what the next best action is or who the next best company to talk to is. That's where you start to use AI to to build a better experience. Yeah. So you're bringing that into your own business. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So just onto some more more general questions, Ria. So first of all, I just wanted to ask you whether you believe that people matter in business, and if so, why? Yeah, I've I built several businesses over the last 20 years and, uh, and mentored quite a lot as well. And, and across all of them, it, it doesn't matter how great the idea is or even how great, how big the industry is. You know, those things may be important for success in the future, but the reality is you're only as good as the people within your company. Making sure that you have the best people working and they're, they're positive about what you're building and where you're going and what you're trying to achieve is as important, if not more important, than everything else. Yes, absolutely. So how do you make sure that you attract and retain those people? There's certainly some companies out there that will struggle depending on that, you know, if their vision isn't, isn't very um, exciting. In fact, we did a, an accelerator uh, program recently. Yes. We asked, it basically put groups of, of companies together and it, it asked the question whether they found that company exciting or not. And, and, and really underlying that is this idea of, of is your vision of the company something that is energizing yes. to not just your 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 teams and your your staff, but also um, the wider audiences, and 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 that's that's part of it. You 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 don't want to be, you know, if you're just building a tactical, you know, piece of infrastructure that it, it doesn't inspire or energize, then in reality, that well, that's the sort of people you're going to, you know, that's how people are going to feel. I guess is the right way of putting it. Within the business, they're going to feel like it's just a turnkey solution that that isn't really delivering any real value and so it's it's figuring out what is the value that you bring to a particular ecosystem and, and, and you know aligning around that really yes i understand and communicating the vision i guess to yeah. both your all of your stakeholders i mean in terms of your vision for your business going forward where would you say that you're you're headed very much towards this idea a better 
buying experience for the buyer. For, for us, this idea that you should bombard people with messages after messages and uh, you know basically using a blunt instrument yeah. to, to deliver results, I think is not one that uh, creates a, a, a you know a positive experience if you like and, and I, I think today we can um, very much start the um, the process of building that um, that approach. So obviously, because you're a B2B company, then you're going to be working on behalf of companies to other companies. But is there, do you also have plans to produce a, a generic product that could be used by consumers? That's a good question. Um, it's something we've paid a lot of thought to, actually. And, yeah. and I think there are there's many people out there that suggest consumer marketing and business marketing are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly on some levels, obviously there's people involved in, in both situations. But I, I think the, the way you buy consumer products and the way you buy business products is very different. And a lot of the techniques that we're building don't really apply to the broader consumer market. There's, there's like obviously exceptions when you're, you're, you know, you're buying things like cars and, and those longer yes. sales on the consumer side but for the most part the the way you manage that buying process is very different and, yes. and actually i think they're, they're very different business and consumer marketing yeah yeah so who would be a typical or an ideal client for you then Diaz? i remember two years ago we we sat down and, and obviously we ate our own dog food right and we, we created our own ideal customer profiles we then went out to try and seek them and it's relatively straightforward. We, we work with, with mid-sized companies, technology companies. We, we um, are very strongly tailored to there and actually manufacturing companies as well. And we primarily look for UK and European headquartered businesses. And, and so that's what we did. That's what we set out to do. And yeah. lo and behold, our, our first client was in Acton, um, but not in the UK or in London. It was in Toronto in, or near Toronto in Canada. Okay. Um, they were a manufacturer and, and they were, they had a, a SaaS like model. But, uh, but yes, it, well, it wasn't, it wasn't quite the ideal customer profile fit. But, but certainly since then, that, that certainly holds true. And, yes. and that, that's, that's the way we sort of look at, look at the world today. Yes. What we, what we do does work across the entire B2B world, but we are focusing very much on tech to start with. Yeah, yeah, okay, um, I understand. What's the best way to create a great company culture then, Piers? For me, company culture is, especially in a startup where um, you're obviously quite small, the, the culture often comes from the leaders within the business and then builds from there over time. And so the actions that the leaders take is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, as you get larger, it becomes much harder to just have the leadership, uh, you know, the leadership doesn't control culture at all. It, it contributes to it and yeah. but it's, it then becomes the wider, the wider company. And so you're, you're trying to guide where the company culture goes over time. And there's definitely ways that you can do it, but it's never as fast as you think to change and shift that one of the examples that I did, had in the past was, you know, if a, a company was working inside a, the email marketing space, which is obviously the, a much more mature industry. Yes. And transforming that into a, a much more, um, in this case, it was an AI consultancy or, or data science consultancy. Yeah. Um, and transforming that, uh, the, the company into that sort of environment where you are trying to invent new ideas and come up with new processes. That's a very different culture to a more mature business. And so... Putting in place programs that, that encourage that innovation, putting in place people who, who represent that culture was a way that we found started and kickstarted that process really. And then, and then obviously you then had to guide the wider company to come along the journey as well. And again, that ties back to the vision of the business. That's very interesting. So what you're saying is that as a, as a business evolves and as perhaps a strategic, strategic direction develops, you have to bring people alongside to support that direction and that speaks almost like a chicken and egg thing that you can't can't be imposed from above, right? No, absolutely not. Yeah, agreed. 
Okay. So how important it is to have fun in business? <laughs> Um, it, it's incredibly important. I think I think a lot of my team members through the years will 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 laugh and say uh, I'm I'm incredibly focused and not uh, not actually the guy who who drives the fun in a business, <laughs> uh, which is probably true. I, I I can get my head down and 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 certainly work away the hours without realizing time is passing by, sort of thing, which it makes it incredibly important for me to make sure I hire people who. Can, can ensure that that fun is happening um, and, and, and make sure they're pulling me along as well so I'm not um, head down um, in work. Um, so, so yeah, it, it all, it's all part of the energy of the business. It, you know, it's all very well having your head down and working, but if you do that day in, day out for, you know, without a break or without having that other side to it, of, of, you, know, you don't re-energize, you don't perform as well. So it's incredibly important. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's very interesting because I was actually talking to a, another entrepreneur about this and what, what he was saying is, is that it's really important to play to your strengths and just be the person that you are. And if you're very, very serious about your work and very driven, then your passion and your energy will bring other people along with you. But then you look for people who are different to complement the things that are not you. So do you look for fun-loving individuals to provide that kind of sense of spirit of light-heartedness yeah absolutely you know knowing where your gaps are as uh, you know especially in a, in a in a smaller business but you know, just as as much in, in a in, in a medium-sized business and a large business is you know knowing knowing the gaps making sure you hire people who can provide those those missing areas is important so what are your core values Riaz, and, and why do they matter so much to you I always come back to one, and actually, we've uh, I've used this a bunch of times over the years, um, and that's curiosity, uh-huh. or, or this idea of why. For me, the businesses I'm typically always trying to build are innov- innovative ones that are looking to push the boundary. Yeah, and that means you very rarely, in fact, never. You can't really look on on the internet and look for best practice advice. You can't really. Um, just go and copy somebody else. You have to sit down and ask the questions that develops the next generation of best practice and, and develop what's next. And to do that, you need curiosity. Yeah, you need the ability to challenge assumptions, um, develop best practice, and, and really push those boundaries. Fantastic. That sounds great. So can I just ask you, Ria, are there any habits that annoy you in others? <laughs> um, are there any habits that annoy me and others? I, I, I think I think the ability to the ability to sit down and have a conversation and actually and actually express your opinion is important. And and so I, I think when people skirt around topics and 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 don't say what needs to be said that. That certainly, I, I'm not one for wasting time, so so I can be quite direct sometimes. So I don't I don't like it when people are sort of wasting time and and something needs to be said. Let's let's have the conversation, and if yes. it's difficult, then let's work through it. Right, right, and I mean ab- absolutely, direct communications are pretty critical, aren't they, to business success? As you said, for two reasons. First of all, you can waste a whole load of time if people are indirect, and secondly. You know, if you get straight to the point quickly, then you can make make progress and move on, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. What What do you think is the best way to generate customer loyalty? Yes. I think that's a really easy question, actually. Um, um, it's to remember that the customer is the reason why you're in business. Yeah. Um, if you put the customer at the center of things and and you know ensure that you communicate well with the customer and understand what their needs are, um, that goes a long way to having a loyal customer. Yes, it's about a dialogue, which which is one of the things that, that you're really um, refining, isn't it? The customer dialogue. And how do you use the information that, that comes back? I mean, it's a, obviously, you know, you'll be feeding back all the responses, won't you, and, and refining yes. your product, but do you have like a specific process for that? Yeah, we, we have several. Um, I mean, we continuously talk to our customers, um, and engage 
um, them in conversations around what they are seeing working, what their challenges are, and, and so on and so forth. So, so there's that organic information that's coming through. But then we also do, at various points in time, we, we test different ideas that we have and, and, yeah. and obviously gauge responses and gauge an understanding of, of what our clients think. And, and, um, you know, only this morning, actually, I was, um, talking with one client around, um, a new product integration where we're launching and, and, you know, what they saw in the future around that integration. And, and people often think, yes, this is what we need. But actually, once you ask the question, um, it's not often quite as straightforward as that. There's, there's nuances to it that can change the way you think about things and actually therefore build a much better platform as a result. Right. So Riaz, what, what, what do you think is the biggest issue going forward in the business of, of tech and marketing? I think it's an interesting time in tech and marketing at, at the moment. The GDPR obviously came out uh, a couple of years ago and, and is starting to change the the way people think about privacy and data. Yeah. And uh, you know, despite having really built my entire career around um, data and behavior of, of people, uh, actually privacy is really important. I think marketers who understand that privacy and understand how to work within it will over time drive better customer loyalty, better success in the market. You know, as we, as we see technology having to adapt yes. to those, to those legal requirements. And actually, one of the things that I've always found is that the, the law generally it, it, it is a is a is a base level, and and actually the companies that do very very well are the ones that actually aim to deliver a better experience beyond that that base level. Yes, absolutely. So it's all about all about the customer experience at the end. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. So I just got a question that I ask all of my interviewees, which is really about your start and end of the day, and whether you've got any particular habits, tips, hacks, anything that you tend to do as a kind of routine to, to start and end your day? So I suspect my start of the day is, is probably not that typical for most people in that I get to drop my daughter to school every day. And given given usually by the time I get home in the evening, she, um, she's, she's already in bed. Yes. And so I don't get to spend huge amounts of time with her. That time in the morning is incredibly precious and, and makes a big difference to the, to the start of every day. Yes. So, so that, that's one thing, probably not the answer you were expecting. I think one of the reasons why a lot of, you know, a lot of people become entrepreneurs is because they want more choice and freedom in their lives. And one of the most, uh, the biggest freedoms of all is, is the freedom to spend time on your terms with the people that you love. Excellent. Well, it's a, I think it's going to only be a good thing. How old is your daughter? Uh, she's eight. Oh, that's lovely. Okay. And what about the evening then, Riaz? How, how do you tend to end the, end the day? I think when at the end of every day, I'm usually, I usually try and find a point at the end of every day where, it, where it's a, a good point to stop. Yeah. Um, rather than leaving something hanging. Yes. That can be dangerous from a time standpoint sometimes, but, yeah. um, that way when I'm coming home, it's a, it's an hour and a half, uh, journey for me to get home so right. so there's plenty of time for me to sort of come out of the day-to-day -day of, of of work and actually I then typically I, I probably should try and get out of work mode completely but that that what I do is something I love to do so so for me thinking about the bigger market and the bigger you know what's going on in the world is, is often what I end up thinking about on my way home and and often you know that's kind of the best time for when I have ideas about the next things we should target or the next things we should think about. So so that's kind of your creative slash strategic time. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, excellent. All I wanted to say is how wonderful it's been to speak to you, Riaz, and how exciting your your business is and getting to grips with the future of tech and marketing and how it works in the B2B space is such an interesting thing to be doing particularly at this time so thank you so much it's been really really great to interview you and we'll look forward to hearing more from you as time goes on that sounds great thank you jane it's been wonderful talking to you thank you very much 
Thanks for listening to the Smart Connector podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not head over to janebaylor.com and order a copy of my free report on building your personal brand. I'd love to connect with you on social media. And finally, don't forget to like and subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss a show. Thanks for listening in and see you soon.